Amen. Welcome. Starting a little bit early, one song short. If you ever saw those movies where they cut your brake lines to try and get you, I think the enemy cut his guitar strings. Ended up with two strings there at the end. He was still driving on like a good soldier, though. Praise God. Amen. Tonight we're continuing our study in the book of Genesis. Our text tonight is Genesis chapter 35. Verses 1 through 15, if you turn there in your Bibles, you can follow along with me as I read. Genesis 35, starting in verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you, purify yourselves, and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. So the name of it was called Alan Bachoth. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore. But Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. Nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you, and to your descendants after you I give this land. Then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him, so Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. We thank you that, Lord, we can gather in your presence, Lord, Open your word, dear God, and hear from you. I pray, Lord God, as I offer my voice to you, Lord, that you speak through me, dear God, only what you want communicated tonight. I pray, Lord, that as your word is taught tonight, dear God, that each and every person that hears my voice, dear God, will be drawn into a closer, more intimate relationship with you. And by chance, Lord, if there are any that are listening that does not know you as their Savior, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would draw them, God, and they would heed your call to come to Jesus and be saved tonight. Lord, it is in that precious name, the name above all names, the only name given under heaven, where men should be saved. It is in that precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Last week, we covered chapter 34. Chapter 34 was a, a sad story about the lust of the flesh. One man lusted after a woman, and he took her inappropriately. Her brothers lusted for revenge. So they deceived, murdered, and plundered 
an entire city. But what is notable about chapter 34 is there is absolutely no mention or allusion to God in that chapter. None whatsoever. God is absent from the hearts, the minds, and of course the actions of all of the players in chapter 34. Fortunately, in our text tonight, that changes. And it changes by God's initiation. You see, when we forget God, it is God who seeks after us to return us to our right state of mind. Verse 30, chapter 35, verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. That one opening phrase is pregnant with meaning. After all of the heartache, pain, and devastation caused by walking according to the flesh with no thought of God, God speaks. The first thing God tells Jacob is to get out of there. When you are at a place where God isn't, then there needs to be a change. I'm not talking about geography because God is everywhere. I'm talking about a place in your heart and in your mind, a place in your circumstances and current situation where there's become a distance between you and God. If you are a believer, you should know what it is like to experience intimacy with God, but possibly that intimacy is missing at this moment in your life. Where there once was peace and security, now there is emptiness. If you've never been born again, then of course you live in a place where you are separated from God. You may not even know that. Perhaps you have religion that makes you feel good and tingly at times, but that is not true fellowship with the Father. For true fellowship with the Father only comes from being born by God's Spirit. If that is you, the answer for you is to surrender your life to Jesus and be born again. For believers, the answer is what God spoke to Jacob. Go to Bethel. Again, it's not the geography. It's what Bethel represents. Bethel is where Abram built an altar and called on the Lord. Bethel is where Jacob dreamed and saw angels ascending and descending on a ladder to and from heaven to earth. Bethel was called Luz back then, and Jacob named it Bethel, house of God, because of that dream he had. God spoke to Jacob there at that place, promising to him all that God had promised to Abraham, it was there that Jacob set a pillar and made a sacred vow to God. So God is sending Jacob back to that special place so he can remember his connection with God. When we feel distant from God, we need to go back in our hearts and in our minds to that place where we were closest to him. We need to remember God's work in our lives. And remembering will bring us back to God. 
Jacob remembered that when he was in distress, God was there. When he was fearful of Esau killing him, God was there. Through every difficulty in Jacob's life, God had always been there. Remembering brought Jacob back into a relationship with God. And that is evident by Jacob's action in our next verse, verse 2. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Jacob had accumulated quite a large group of people. He has his family members. He has his servants, including the women and children from Shechem. I don't imagine that during Jacob's time in Shechem that he was having family devotions or establishing the principles of God for those under his leadership. Shechem was a dark time without the presence of God, but now was a time for change. Jacob tells them to put away the foreign gods and to change their clothes. This is repentance. It's time to turn to God from sin. Of course, putting away the foreign gods and changing their garments, these things are symbolic. Yes, the people did possess actual physical gods that needed to be discarded, but real idolatry is that which takes place in the heart. Idolatry is when you place anything in your life in the place that only God belongs. When God wrote out for Moses with his finger the Ten Commandments, the first commandment given in Exodus 20, verse 2 and 3 says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment elaborates on the first commandment, forbidding idolatry. Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6. Make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I... The Lord your God am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. God is a jealous God. God allows no one to take his rightful place. Our gracious and loving God is the ruler of the universe and has the right to be the ruler in our lives. You see, when you don't have time to have devotions and, and Bible reading with your family, yet you have time to watch television for hours every day, that's idolatry. When you forsake the assembling of the saints together, when you don't have time to bring your family to church because you'd rather be watching sports or, or fishing or, or hunting or doing anything else, that's idolatry. When your selfish desires have replaced the desire for God in your life, that's idolatry. Jacob instructed his people to put away the false gods, the idols. And we must tell ourselves to do the same, to put away anything that seeks to compete 
with God in our lives. God is supreme, and he deserves first place. The Bible says you are not your own, but you are bought with a price. Therefore, therefore glorify God in your bodies, which are the Lord's. Jesus paid the ultimate price for us. He paid his precious blood. We are not our own. We belong to him. If there's anything that we have elevated above God and allowed to take the place of God, to take a priority in our lives, it must be put away. Jacob told them to go and change their clothes. The Bible speaks of changing clothes in several places. One place is Zechariah chapter 3. There's a vision of the high priest, Joshua. He's standing before the angel of the Lord. And when you see that phrase, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it is the pre-incarnate Jesus. The accuser, Satan, is also there to oppose. And Jesus rebukes Satan. What is Satan's cause for accusation? Joshua, the high priest, is standing in the place of ministry before Jesus in filthy garments. So what does Jesus do? Let's read it. Zechariah 3, verses 3 through 5. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. That's what Jesus does. Jesus removes from us the filthy garments of sin and flesh, and he gives us the robes of righteousness. Isaiah 61.10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. The Lord wants to change our clothes. Romans 13, 14 says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. We are to take off the garments of our filthy flesh and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jacob goes on in verse 3, Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. Jacob now is remembering what it was like to walk with God. He remembers what it was like to trust in God. His intent to rekindle the fire of his relationship with God is there. He says, let's arise and go to Bethel. I'm going to build an altar there to God, the one who answered me when I cried out in my distress. Verse 4, so they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. Now some commentators believe that the earrings were used as charms and amulets. And some of them bore the markings and descriptions of the false gods. So all of these things were given to Jacob, and Jacob hid them. He did not want these items 
to be reclaimed. He hid them from the people. He didn't want his people to backslide and go back to recover these things. How I wish that I could hide the foreign gods from those who are susceptible to being deceived. I remember when Pastor Todd and I sat right there on that front row, begging a young woman and a young man to turn away from a false god. Unfortunately, you cannot hide false gods from those who are of age because false gods are everywhere. We can only proclaim the true and living God to those who have an ear to hear and give them the opportunity to choose. But when it comes to our younger children, that's a different story. We must hide false gods from them. We must make the ungodly influences that are seeking to draw our children away from God unavailable to them. Parents, you cannot be lazy in this regard. You must monitor what your children are watching on television or what they are accessing through the Internet. If you have little ones, you must understand which cartoons are inundating your children with ungodliness. Yes, cartoons. They're going for your children at the earliest of ages. They're creating an avenue for Satan to exploit your children. You must take away the ungodly influences and get your children to Bethel. Bethel means house of God. Hebrews 3, verses 1 through 6, tells us, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his, that is God's house, for this one, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his, again, God's house, as a servant for testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ, as a son, over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. We are God's house individually and collectively. So we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We are to be in God's house. We are to be with God's people, speaking God's word, encouraging one another, praising God together, testifying of all that God has done and is doing in our lives, testifying of how we are trusting God in all things. This is how we keep our children and ourselves out of the clutches of the wicked one. This is how we keep ourselves from idolatry and from being controlled by the world, the flesh, and the devil. Verse 5. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. You will remember, after the sons of Jacob slaughtered all of the men of the city of Shechem and took captive all of the, 
the women and the children and took all of their cattle. Jacob was worried about the surrounding people. He said, you've done it. We're going to be odious to these people and they're going to attack us. But no, verse 5 says, the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them. They did not pursue the sons of Jacob. This is God's supernatural protection on them. Why? Because God spoke to them. Jacob repented. They gave up their false gods. They changed their clothes, and they are in obedience to God now. They're going where God wants them to be. They're in the center of God's will, and God is not going to allow any evil to befall them. No one is going to attack them because God has put fear into the hearts of those who might even consider it. Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. The scripture says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. When God is protecting you, you are protected. The only way anything can get to us is when God allows it. And when God allows something into our lives, he allows it for his purpose. Know that you are always in God's hand. You are always being protected by the Lord. Verse 6, so Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him, and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. There is one thing to have the intention of doing God's will, and it's a completely other matter to follow through and actually do God's will. Jacob actually did God's will. When God told him to go to Bethel and he told the people, get rid of the false gods, change your clothes, we're going there. I'm going to build an altar. That's what Jacob did. James 1, 22 through 25 says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Did you pick up on that imagery? If, if you are a hearer and not a doer of the word, it's like you're about to leave your house. So you look in the mirror, your hair's a mess, your face is all dirty and greasy, you have food in your teeth, right? As soon as you turn away from the mirror, you forget. You don't comb your hair. You don't clean your face and you don't remove the food out of your teeth because instantly, as soon as you turned away from the mirror, you forgot. So you leave and you're still an absolute mess. That's what it's like when you're a hearer of the word of God and not a doer. You come to church, you hear God's word. Maybe even in your personal time, you're studying God's word, but you don't apply God's word to your life. If that's the case, what good does God's word do you? You become stagnant. You're not growing in sanctification in your life, just like your hair, your face, and your teeth with spinach hanging out is a mess. We are to be doers of God's word. We are to follow through because that is the one, the one that is a doer of God's word 
is the one that is blessed. Jacob said he was going to build an altar there, and he did. Jacob followed through. When God told Jacob to go to Bethel, Jacob took God at his word. He got rid of the false gods. He made his way to Bethel, and he built the altar, setting up worship to God. He called that place El Bethel, or God of Bethel. Or even more literally, God of the house of God. He was where God wanted him to be, doing what God wanted him to do. Verse 8. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree. So the name of it was called Alan Batchel. Rebekah, of course, is Jacob's mother. She is probably already deceased at this point in the narrative. How her nurse, Deborah, came to be part of Jacob's caravan is not told to us in Scripture. Commentators have their opinions. In fact, here is the only mention of Deborah in Scripture by name. What we only really know about Deborah is since her death and burial is mentioned here, that she must have been a beloved member of the family. They called the tree that she was buried under Alan Bacheth, which means oak of weeping. So even though this is Deborah's only mention in the Bible, she obviously was a significant person in the life of this family. Verse 9. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. Jacob is gone and Israel is back. When God changes us, God does not want us to be like dogs who return to their vomit. God does not want us to be like pigs who return to the slop. God wants you to go from glory to the next level of glory. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. That is God's will for us, not to go back. But when we do lose our way, when we do get off track, we can be assured that if we truly belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, that God will discipline us in order to get us back where we belong. Hebrews 12, 6 through 8 says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have been partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. God disciplines us because God loves us. When we get off track, God wants us to get back on track. 1 Corinthians eleven thirty one 31 and 32 says, For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. This passage gives us the secret. You don't want God spanking your butt? Correct yourselves, right? When the Holy Spirit convicts your heart and tells you that you've done wrong, get it right, right? Dylan, DJ, when you do wrong, go confess before they find out. 
Tell them you're sorry. You'll spare yourself the chastening. Verse 11. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you. And to your descendants after you, I give this land. God reiterates the promises of Abraham and Isaac to Jacob. He says, you are the heir. You are the one who will get all of this because you are in that place where I want you to be. Verse 13, then God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him Bethel. Back to that place. It's come back full circle where Jacob is back in the place where God wants him to be. He is back in the house of God. He is back in the place of blessing. He is back in the place where he's no longer Jacob, but now he is Israel. He's back in the place where God is reconfirming to him all the promises and all the blessings. He's back in the place where he's building an altar, where he's praising God, where he's repenting, and where he's doing right. And that is the place where we want to live. We want to live right there in the center of God's will. We don't want to stray, not for a moment. Whenever we get out of God's will, we immediately want to confess and forsake our sin. So there is no distance between us and the one that loves us. That is our place of safety. That is our place of security. That is our place of peace. And that is the place that when the world looks at you and sees what you have in your life and how you are handling the pressures of this world and not folding under, when God sees that, then God is having his way with you. And God is able to touch those people and draw them to himself and people are being saved. That is the testimony that we need to have. That is the testimony that I witnessed my brother Felipe have in the hospital today. And that he's having right now, he's probably watching right now online. God bless you, Felipe. We need to have that testimony. No matter what we are going through, knowing that God is faithful, knowing that eternity is what matters most. And that whatever we are going through, the Bible says it's a light affliction compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. We need to keep our eyes on the eternal, looking not at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. 2 Corinthians 4. 18, maybe 19. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we can go from chapter 34, where just all types of ugliness is going on, and you're teaching us what not to do, to chapter 35, where we see what it's like to get right with you to be found at Bethel, the house of God, to be found in your will. We thank you, Lord, for all of these examples that you have given us, dear God, that shows us that we need to be close to you. We need to be in that intimate relationship with you. So, Lord God, I thank you for these faithful saints that are here, Lord God, hearing your word, dear God, and fellowshipping with you tonight. 
Lord, if there's any God that are listening that does not know you as their Savior, I want to invite them, dear God, to come into a personal relationship with you through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you do not have that intimate relationship with God, just trust him. Surrender your life to him. Jesus shed his blood for you on Calvary's cross. If you believe that he shed his blood for you on that cross that he was buried and three days later he rose from the grave. If you believe that 40 days later he ascended to heaven and sat down on the right hand of God the Father and that was for the justification of your sins. The Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call out to him and receive him as your Lord. Surrender your life to him, and God will change you. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed. Behold, the new has come. You will know that experience. That is the experience of the new birth, of being born again, and you will know that you belong to Jesus. Father, we love you. We thank you. We're looking for the soon return of your son to snatch us away Lord as the world is growing darker as we're getting closer and closer to the end dear God so we are looking for Jesus to return any day but should you tarry Lord let us be faithful dear God in representing you well let us dear God continue to not look at the things that are seen but the things that are unseen for the things that are seen are temporal, and yes, God, the things that are unseen are eternal. We love you, Father, so please dismiss us in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Please join us on Sunday as we continue our study through the Gospel of John. Have a good night and a safe trip home. Lord bless you.